Hello, hello, hello. Um, just today I'm going to just cover Nyson. I just had some just a while, while ago. That's why I'm a bit on the redder side and on the forehead and stuff like that, a bit on the face and all that. Bit of a flush, but anyway, you know, shit happens. Um, I did go, I was out all day today in the sun, walking in midday for a couple of hours. So, you know, I've got a, as you can see, a bit of redness around there, you know, so. There's not much around here. This is still what whitish in a sense. Um, it's a bit here, a bit on the ears, you know, from the sun. But I've had a bit of retinol, um, a bit of niacin. That's protective, so that'll help. But today we're talking about niacin. And we will basically look at some areas in regards to it. Let me just share. Oops. And a share. Okay, well, most people basically pretty much know about, um, yeah, sorry about the hairs a bit on the rough side, I forgot to brush it. Um, so the influence of uh, nicotinic acid, uh, which is the nice thing that I take, it's actually gone up in price. I actually just bought some a couple of days ago because um, my other stash is starting to go down. And it went up from 30, what was it, about $36. It's now 40 bucks. Yeah, not happy. Anyway, but this is high quality stuff. It is the stuff that um, is um, clinically proven, pharmaceutical grade, registered with the Australian government for use as therapeutic agents. So it's not the sort of stuff that you get in supplements and stuff like that. It's clear, clean, nicotinic acid, nothing else in it. So let's make that quite clear. Now, influence of nicotinic acid on metabolism of cholesterol and triglycerides. Obviously, it's something that we've spoken before. Yes, it does lower VLDL. And obviously, anything that lowers triglycerides and VLDL will lower actually also LDL. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing. So that's why I'm not into, you know, high dosing, you know, like over a thousand milligrams and stuff like that, uh, for the reason that it's not a good thing um, in that regard. So I would stick to the lower amounts so I can get some of the therapeutic benefits in terms of, you know, for skin and other things um, in general, the NAD pathways and stuff like that. So. But, it, you know, it will have a bit of an effect. It will also have a bit of an effect on your HDL. So this is the protein that is transcripted by your genes, in particular this gene here. You key. There it is, that lovely little gene there, and that will actually... Um, is involved in producing HDL. Now, that does get degraded. What niacin does is it actually has a protective effect. Now, I don't have the study here, um, but I have read it in the past, and it does have a protective effect. It does actually say it's a major um, protein component of HDL particle anyway. But niacin does protect. It is somewhere in this study. Um, but I'm not going to basically try and search for it. Can't remember. You can actually look it up yourselves if you're fucking interested. And basically it protects from the degrading of this actual protein. So it actually slows down the degradation. Um, and, and also because it's reducing VLDL, you end up with lower trigs, lower VLDL, um, slightly lower LDL, which isn't, you know, necessarily a, a great thing, but that's in the high doses. So it doesn't, you won't get much of that effect in the lower doses that I actually deal with sub 300 milligrams. Um, but at the same time, it will, even in those levels, it will protect your HDL, which is a good thing in a sense, probably some of those vegetated people should basically be on niacin to help their HDL because it degrades far more in there on their stupid diet. Anyway, let's move on. This is the main 
protein, uh, sorry, main gene um, that's involved, the ApoA1. And this is one of the key SNPs. And these are the alleles. Uh, anyway, so the common one, your dear friend, Harry, that's my 23 and me thing, Harry, obviously. Um, and I've got the GG. G, 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 G. Anyway, back to here, which is the reverse CC. A, A, T is that. So CC, G, G, and AC, and CC is the common one. And the risk one is the TT, which is a pathogenic. Now, this one here, which is this one here, which is a mutation, um, which was found in Italy. That's what's called the ApoA1 Milano and was identified back in 74. It lowers HDL, but increases triglycerides. So, you know, if you're a metabolically syndrome individual, it will be worse for you with this mutation because you'll have even higher triglycerides than normal and lower HDL. But they think that there is an association, and that's all it fucking is, that it protects against cardiovascular disease. Again, this is the craziness because it has an effect on some of the other lipids. You know, same sort of bullshit, you know, different day. Um, in combination with a low cholesterol diet, it induces rapid and significant regression of atherosclerosis in mice. Um, crap. Absolute crap, because basically, as I've always said, the chow that they give to mice and stuff like that is very different. Their, met their lipid metabolism is very different to ours. So it's who gives a shit, basically, is the operative word. So basically, we'll ignore all that because it is nonsense. And we'll focus on, you know, some of the other benefits of niacin. Anyway, they actually are promoting here and saying, oh, statins is much better because CoA reductase inhibitors like statin is much better at lowering HDL. Oh, sorry, LDL. Who gives a shit? So therapy with niacin is unique that it improves all lipid abnormalities, lipoprotein abnormalities. Um, it significantly reduces low density lipoprotein cholesterol, triglycerides, and LP little a, while increasing high density lipoprotein cholesterol levels. Well, we know HDL because it basically prevents the degradation of that protein that's involved in HDL. So that's the reason for it. You'll end up with higher HDL. Whether that's actually protective or not is a mute point because there are associations out there that show high HDL and low LDL can, if it's pharmaceutically induced, have been shown to cause problems as well. Side effects and all sorts of other issues. So they've never proved, you know, it's the same old bullshit, different day. But at a lower dose, you're not going to have these significant changes to our natural occurring, um, but you will get some benefit of improving your HDL status slightly at the lower dose at the th sub 300, which is what I recommend. Nothing above that in that regard. So, so it can improve things, but this is their focus there. You know, the madness, the hatred of, animal products and the hatred of basically is what they try and cause force people on very high doses which is really bad high doses anything above 300,000 is problematic prevents gluconeogenesis um blood sugar 
because by forcing down triglycerides, it doesn't allow the body to actually, um, it can be at those levels, it can be problematic with the liver in actually in turning that sugar into triglycerides and putting it away safely, which is what the body's designed to do when you actually put, so by reducing triglyceride levels, you're actually, you're actually increasing the level of sugar in the bloodstream, which isn't a good thing. So that is why I don't recommend high dose niacin for that reason. And we will move on. That's my shit. Okay. Now let's look at some of the other benefits of niacin. So this randomized trial of nicotinamide and vitamin E, we're talking about low dose, obviously, which will, should be always focused in children with recent onset diabetes type 1. Anyway, various adjacent and therapies have been introduced along with intensive insulin therapy in patients with recent onset type 1 diabetes. In a administered at diagnosis of the disease can have beneficial effects on the clinical remission rates, improve metabolic control, preserve or slightly increase function. So, basically, what is the biggest problem of young kids which have been identified with type 1 diabetes or type 1 diabetic people sometimes that have gone to excessive levels um, of diabetes 2 and end up with adult onset diabetes 1 because I've got so much beta, um, beta cell lo um, function loss. This, niacin can have a protective effect and not only a protective effect, but actually can reverse some of those effects. Probably by reducing the toxicity due to free oxygen radicals, vitamin E also known as an antioxidant inhibits lipid peroxidation, which can lead to the protection of um, islet beta cells from the combined effects of interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor and gamma interferon. The aim of the present study was to investigate whether the addition of vitamin E and NA could improve metabolic control and the residual beta cell function as measured by C peptides secretion in children and adolescents with recent onset type 1 diabetes patients and followed up for two year diagnosis. Anyway, they've seen some improvements, which is good. And this is in other study, primary and secondary prevention of type 1 diabetes. We'll just go to the abstract. People want to go away and look at the studies. You go on, you go for it. Um, uh, anyway, type 1 diabetes is an immunological mediated disease. Immune intervention should alter the natural history of the disease. This article reviews pre prevention studies undertaken in prior or any evidence of autoimmunity. Primer, primary prevention or after the development of islet autoantibodies, secondary prevention. Most immune cancer studies have been conducted in recent onset type 1 and basically on the tertiary side. And there are, um, and there are not reviewed hearing. So they're not looking at basically tertiary. So we want to look at you know primary prevention. Can reduce the autoimmunity issues can you deal with the antibody type effect, auto antibody effects on you know losing and damaging more of these islets oh, the goal and the secondary intervention arrested immune thus prevent the clinical disease primarily preventions have conducted in infants with high genetic risk interventions tested include Several dietary manipulations, including infant formula free of the cow milk or bovine insulin supplements, supplemented with omega 3s, DHA, delayed introduction of gluten containing foods, good idea, and vitamin D supplementation. Secondary prevention has been conducted in both children and adults with diabetes autoantibodies. 
that means you know we we've got active sort of assault on the beta cells interventions tested include nicotina nicotinamide so basically your niacin your b3 insulin injections and remember the biggest problem is the reason why i talk about niacin is because this does um, reduce with age as you know it's being you could say re lost degraded and we've talked about that before but the the nad precursors and stuff like that you've heard me whine about about those so insulin injections or insulin those were insulin blah 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 like secondary prevention and basically they saw improvements in that regard sue anyway other factors interesting obviously the skin issues look at the difference mm. anyway we'll get to that later on okay 45 year old patient described in this case classical case of pellagra patient was initially brought to a psychiatric hospital because of a disorderly behavior and this is the thing you know we think about you know like pellagra and things you know like skin really poor skin and stuff like that and you know th that's another reason why you know um, my aim was more for the heart protective elements but uh, you know and, and i realized that you know a diet plays a much more important role in that rather than trying to manipulate hdl and ldl and all that sort of shit um but you know i've, I've continued nice and because i found all these other benefits with the skin improving maintaining a bit more youthful considering all the things that i've done to my body over years you know cardiovascular disease 10 years ago and all the other shit that i've done i mean i've got friends that are basically younger than me that have had none of this you know not a poor diet and all that and their skin looks older than mine so i put it down to nice and playing a big role in improving my skin um compared to them and keeping it more youthful and as um a son of one of my friends said harry why don't you put a bit of dye through your hair you'll look a hell of a lot younger and i said i'm not that vain <laughs> so these people were encouraging me to do things and all that and i said you know look my genetics are that I'm predisposed to go grey much earlier and I haven't gone really, really grey. So I put that down to my diet. But obviously, you know, if you've got some genetic predisposition after a number of generations, it's going to be pronounced and strong, you know, to go grey and also go bald. Um, my father has improved his um, sort of hair density because it was more thinner since he's been consuming more meat my uncle nick has still not changed his ways i'm his younger brother and the one that had the two the two strokes and he basically um has far more balding and so does his first son and his other son so it does run in the family it's something that due to and i had a lot of um some pattern balding as well happening when i was you know, and a big pop belly and whatever else. And some of that actually has improved. So in the last 10 years, my hair's thickened. Generally, you know, things have improved. My skin is better. A lot of things was very pasty and shit and looked much older. So a lot of it, things have improved in the last 10 years. Um, we can't expect miracles, as my friends say. Bastards. But, uh, you know, much better than what I was in the past and way better. And I put it down not only to the carnival diet or the low-carb diet and all that, but also to nice and having a, a nice, playing a nice role in that as well. Anyway, let's move on. Talked enough about myself. I'm getting bored with it. Okay. Schizophrenia. Oh, well, you know, losing your marbles. Anyway. It is well known that niacin deficiency manifests with severe psychiatric manifestations. And we know high 
animal foods are very high in, especially bacon. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, that poof is going to kill you. Yeah. Might protect you like it does those rats. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm being facetious for those who didn't pick up on that. And you know, there's a lot of stuff in the literature. I mean, I don't want to bore you by going through, you'd go through thousands and thousands of studies, but just trust me on this. If you do a PubMed thing and put niacin and, you know, psychiatric disorders of any sort, it'll cut, you'll get a lot of studies coming up, I can tell you. Also, historic evidence has accumulated, yes, accumulated shitloads on PubMed, that niacin documentation can be used for treatment of schizophrenia. However, Etiopathology association between ice and deficiency and schizophrenia is as well as the mechanism of action in ice in its treatment. So they know quite a bit about how it all sort of works in that regard. More importantly, the subgroup schizophrenia, which will respond to ice and augmentation, has never been highlighted in the literature. Yeah, fair enough. There are some, so, some others. You know, there may be some under other underlying things. So anyway, one, niacin deficiency and neurodegeneration, membrane phospholipid deficiency hypothesis. That is a hypothesis. And so is this, you know, adrenochrome hypothesis. And there's mixed stuff in the literature. Remember, a lot of people are mixed macro, mixed diets and shit diets that are being observed. So they only really can actually show that if you reduce nice and you create nice and deficient, you will see neurodegeneration. So I suspect that niacin is protective in a number of ways with a whole lot of these other areas. It just hasn't been proven yet. It will eventually, I believe. Uh, here we propose a model that subset of schizophrenia can respond to nice and augmentation therapy better than other subsets because these patients also contributions in their psychiatric manifestations from the neural degeneration resulting from nice and deficiency. And this is really important, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, all these sort of things. It is neural degeneration, guys. So, Narsen is protective to keep you sane. You don't lose your marbles in old age. Anyway, so that's that other point. I'm going to pause here so I can actually get the other studies all up and running because I'm a lazy prick and haven't got all my stuff opened yet. So I will pause here and we will move on to the next part. Okay, back to it. Now, let's go and look at some of the other stuff. And let's share. Okay. This is on the NIH. It's about books, you know, books that actually cover all these sort of things. It's the stuff that I've used before to show the different minerals and the different excretion rates and all that. These are important because they're a good, really good source in understanding how some of these, um, how the information was collated scientifically in the past and all that, how it was actually measured. And so I like looking at these sort of things. I'm not going to cover this part yet. I mean, I've spoken in the past of NAD. So you guys are quite clear about, um, you know, the importance of in energy production in terms of NAD. I will cover that in a separate thing because um, I've discussed about it, but I do want to cover really in depth about the mitochondrial role of uh, niacin and its metabolites and how they basically do their magic and the importance um, in comparison to some other stuff in that regard. Okay, so that's what they consider the upper tolerance uh, for people before they start getting flushing and all, which was based on flushing. <laughs> so what I'm doing is 250 milligrams, which is what I had today, which is seven times that. But still, 
in a much safer area because it's below 300, which tends to be quite safe in terms of some of the other ramifications. That means the effects on gluconeogenesis and many other things. So that's why I don't go over that limit. And that's why you should stay below the 300 milligram limit. Okay. That is non-negotiable. So, you know, if you want to create havoc in your low carb keto or carnivore um, sort of diet situation, go over 300 and cause yourself more deranged deregulation. You shouldn't. Okay, we've got a clean diet. We don't need high levels of niacin. Um, we need, you know, good levels of niacin. Um, you know, I mean, even if you go for like a 50 milligram, where you get very little flushing and all that, there are supplements out there, great. You know, you will get a lot of benefits if you do it on a prolonged, long-term basis and you can actually buy nice and at that level, you know. Anyway, let's move on because I did want to cover, I didn't want to cover the NAD pathways because we'll, we'll, I will go into that in the future um, in that regard. But let's go to the main thing that we've always talked about in terms of deficiencies and it's pellagra. Okay, clinical pellagra may represent in various degrees of combined niacin and riboflavin deficiencies. Okay, so there's a bit of research there that goes back to 1985. Anyone, anyone want to look at that? Oops. That's in the, that's right, it's in the book. It's not a linked. So you'd have to look at the book to get the actual link or do a search on those names and 1985 in PubMed. Anyway, we'll move on. Deficiencies of other micronutrients, um, pyridoxin and iron required to convert tryptophan to niacin may also contribute to the appearance of pellagra. 